So I actually wish I stuck with the title that I gave David because I was just asked to talk in the math department in about 20 years of May, and I think I can't do the same title again, so I'll have to think of it. <laughs> this title would have been okay for the math department. So, uh, Professor, Jones, oh, no, could no. you turn off the lights, please? Which button? Which button? Which button? No. So, the Jones polynomial has to do with knots in ordinary three-dimensional space. We often run into a tangledness of string, so we know that a knot in three-dimensional space can be a very complicated thing. And around 30 years ago, the mathematician Vaughn Jones, who actually had been studying operator algebras, his background was not in knots or topology, found a fundamental new way of studying knots, which is related to statistical mechanics and mathematical physics in many different ways. And today I'll be telling you a few new twists on this relationship that could be of interest. So I don't want to assume you all know about the Jones polynomial, so I'll start with the definition. And for gravity, I'll start with something called the vertex model, which, as you'll see, is related to a discrete version of statistical <coughs> mechanics. So you start with a knot, such as this one, in ordinary three dimensional space, but then you project it onto a plane, for example, the plane of the screen. And having made that projection, we're going to do a discrete version of statistical mechanics. So there are certain points here where two strands cross, like here, or their local maxima, like this one, or that one. So you remove all the crossing points and all the local maxima and minima, and you label what's left by symbols plus or minus. So, and then for each, uh, then you're in the sum over each labeling with suitable factors for both crossings and also for maxima and minima, which we'll show on the next page. So here I've shown some of the possible labeled crossings. Actually, not all of them. The other ones are all weighted by zero. For each of the ones I've... For each of the ones I've labeled... This is not them, I don't have permission to start talking. <laughs> for each of the ones I've labeled, uh, that I've indicated, I've shown a function of a complex variable q. So for example, this labeling is weighted by q to the one quarter, and this one by zero. And then, similarly for maxima and minima, which if you think of the vertical direction as time, you could think of the maxima and minima as creation of annihilation events for a part of an antiparticle pair. So at a maximum and minimum, we create or annihilate a pair whose charge adds up to zero, and we weight them by these factors. And these factors probably look like they came out of thin air, and that's the point. So there are these crazy factors that come out of thin air. And you do a discrete version of statistical mechanics. So in this knot, if you remove all the maximum, minimum, and crossings, you'd have roughly 30 pieces left. And so there'd be 2 to the 30 ways to label them. And you do a discrete sum of 2 to the 30 terms each of which would be a product of factors that would look like either this or this. And after you calculate the discrete partition function, you get a Laurent polynomial in Q to the F that's known as the Jones polynomial for that number. So the main idea here is, or Jones's discovery, is that the output of the finite sum does not depend on the choice of how the knot was projected to the plane. And so the Jones polynomial is a knot invariant. So this way of defining the Jones polynomial is completely not obviously invariant. We have a three-dimensional knot. We project it to the plane. We do this crazy discrete statistical mechanics. And after adding two to the 30 terms, we get an answer, which is a function of Q, that doesn't depend on exactly how we projected it to the plane. So, Jones discovered this about 30 years ago, and soon after, a lot of closely related descriptions were found that often involved mathematical physics, statistical mechanics, two-dimensional conformal field theory, and more. So all these definitions made the Jones polynomial completely computable. You add to the 30 terms, and you come back after a finite amount of time. But it was always a mystery why it was a topological invariant. 
all constructions involved ingredients that look like they've been pulled out of thin air, like the particular local factors that we used in that vertex model, the loose green statistical mechanics. But you could magically check that it worked. You could prove that if you change the way the non had been projected, the sum would come out to be the same. In the course of this work in the mid 80s, an important clue emerged something like the Jones polynomial can be defined for every Lie group G and representation R. So the Jones polynomial is the case that G is SU2 and R is the spin half representation. And plus and minus you can think of as the spin up and spin down states of the spin half particle. That has an analog for higher spin and also for other Lie groups. So with these clues and also some advice from the mathematician Michael Atia, I found in 1988 a description of the Jones quantum in terms of three-dimensional gauge theory. So this is going to be a lot like standard three-dimensional quantum gauge theory as used in particle physics and nowadays also in condensed matter physics, except that the action is going to be different and of course we'll be in three space-time dimensions instead of four. We consider a gauge group G with a gauge group A, and we're trying to make topological invariants, which means that unlike quantum electric dynamics or quantum chromodynamics, where the Lorentz metric of space-time is used in making the action, here we better not use a metric, because if we use a metric, then we will lose topological invariants. Uh, the way the knot is embedded in the space-time will matter. So if we're trying to write a gauge invariant of local function of a gauge field that we can define by integration over M or some local expression, where there's no metric we're allowed to use, we only have an orientation. There's only one such function, which is the turn Simons invariant of the gauge field. And it'll be familiar to many of the particle theorists and condensed matter theorists. But if you're not familiar with it, don't worry about it. For this lecture, you don't need to know anything about it except that it's gauge invariant, well, it's almost gauge invariant. It's invariant under gauge transformations that are continuously connected to the identity. But there are so-called big gauge transformations under which this function jumps by 2 pi times an integer. So even if you've never heard of this function before, if you're willing to believe that just in three dimensions, we can write this nice function, which is gauge invariant up to 2 pi times an integer, then we're OK. That's all you really need to know. So what would be called the partition function in quantum gauge theory is gotten by integrating the overall connections, all gauge fields, dividing by the volume of the gauge field. And what you integrate is the exponential of the action. Now, if we were doing quantum electrodynamics, then the action would be something else. It would be the maximal action, sometimes called e squared minus d squared. And what it would multiply would be 1 over basically one over the fine pressure constant. But here, instead of the maximal action, we're using the churn Simons function. And what it multiplies has to be i times an integer. And the reason for that is that the churn Simons function is only gauge invariant of modular 2 pi times an integer. So to make this exponential gauge invariant, we have to exponentiate it multiplied by i, the square root of minus 1, times an integer. So, okay, formally this is a lot like the path integral of QCD, the theory of strong interactions, except that with three dimensions instead of four, and the action is the term Simons function instead of usually Yang-Mills action, and we've left out the quarks. Now the choice of action makes a big difference. QCD describes particles with masses and magnetic like and scattering amplitudes and all the rest. But all that only makes sense when you have a space-time metric so that, for instance, the particles travel inside the light cone. Since this theory doesn't, is defined without using a space-time metric, it can't possibly describe any kind of local propagation of signals. The signals wouldn't know how to propagate. All it can do is produce topological invariants. So it's sometimes called a topological quantum field theory. So unlike the QCD path integral, that gives us particle physics. This analog is going to give us a topological invariant since it's defined with no structure on these three manifold M, 
that's at the right tension. So this is an invariant of the three manifold together with the mixture. Now, if we're interested in knots, the three manifold point to just R3, which is like the space in this room, which is that exciting topologically, but we want to consider an embedded circle. So we have an embedded oriented circle in here, which you could think of as the world line of a charged particle that was created, went around the loop in space time, and annihilated. So what we're going to do with the circle what we usually do with gauge theory. We pick a representation of the gauge group. I know a representation of K, but it's meant to be a representation of G, the gauge group. We pick a representation of the gauge group, and we find the Wilson loop operator, which you parallel transport a particle around the knot, and then you take the trace in the corresponding representation. If this were quantum electrodynamics, which some of electricity magnetism, which some of you will be more familiar with, there's no trace. The representation is one dimensional. Representation is just given by an integer of charge. So there would be an integer in the next one. And usually it would be written in I. So the, the electromagnetic version of this would just be the exponential of I times the integer times the electromagnetic potential. <coughs> but anyway, in the standard model of particle physics or in condensed matter physics, if you're considering quasi particle impurities, you include a factor like this to describe the heavy part traveling on the path K and interacting with the gauge. <coughs> so then we define a path integral in the presence of the heavy part. So we integrate a gauge field, same as before, but now we include a factor of the Wilson loop operator. So again, this is obviously a topological invariant. And in QCD, the same principle, <coughs> except that this would have to be the Yang Mills rather than the Chern Simon method, is used to study quark confinement. So if we specialize to the case that our three manifold is just ordinary three space, R3, and we take the gauge group to be SU2, the smallest non-related group at R to be the two-dimensional representation, then it turns out that this path integral is the Jones polynomial evaluated at a particular value of Q. So that's only a discrete set of values of Q, but since the Jones polynomial is a polynomial, knowing its value of these different set of values determines it, although it doesn't give a natural explanation from this point of view of why it's all wrong for the moment. So this uh, definition has more or less the opposite drawbacks and virtues of other definitions. For example, if you go back to the very beginning, uh, it was completely not obvious that these rules uh, give a topological invariant. They're taken completely out of thin air. But it is completely obvious that it's a well-defined procedure for each projection of the line. Here, we're in the opposite situation. It's not obvious that it makes any sense, but if you have studied the normalization theory of quantum field theory, then you'll see that that framework, I'm hiding a few details, but basically you'll find that that framework will tell us that this makes sense. But it's not at all obvious that you can calculate it. So we've achieved topological invariance at the cost of not having such an obvious algorithm to calculate. But you can show that actually this equals the Jones polynomial at a particular value of Q. So like I say, it's a definition of the Jones polynomial with more or less opposite advantages and drawbacks than Jones's definition. So the argument that the invariance that you get from the gauge theory agrees with the Jones polynomial was made by finding a link between three-dimensional gauge theory and two-dimensional conformal field theory. And that link is actually also important in condensed matter physics, in studies of the quantum Hall effect and related phenomena. Basically, in that context, the uh, conformal field theory has to do with what people in that field call the edge exhibitions. Usually, you've got a two-dimensional sample. It's a finite sample, so it has an edge. 
there are interesting explanations at the edge. That's where the formal field theory takes. The sample is two dimensional, but if you include time, it describes a two plus one dimensional world. And a two plus one dimensional world volume with the sample it's in. And it turns out that interesting properties of quantum all systems, especially in the case of fractional quantum all systems, can be described by churn time and gauge theories in three dimensions. And the same link, so the way the, the interplay between the bulk and the edge ex, the boundary edge explanations uh, in that context is a counterpart of the relationship here, which is used to show that this definition agrees with the Jones model. This definition agrees with the Jones model. So the role of Chern Simon's gauge theory in the fractional quantum hall effect is probably the main reason that might be familiar with physics. Gates theories with the turn sign of the gauge group are used to describe what's called topological order in fractional quantum law systems. For example, some, there's something called the Moore-Reed state, which uses non-Euclidean turn sign theory to describe a particular system. 